Hey guys, my name is Ravi Sharma and I'm the founder and buyer's agent here at Search Property. Thank you for joining me on yet another episode of Search Property TV. If you're new here on this channel, we talk about Australian real estate, passive income and financial independence. So if that's topics that you're interested in, subscribe down below. Now I introduced to you the property wrap, that show I brought in about a week or two ago, where we go through news articles or media headlines and we really dissect fact from fiction. So today's topic is about how Westpac is now predicting a house surge, a property price surge, and how there's expected to be a property boom in about two to three years. So let's dive in. Okay, so Westpac predicts house price surge. This came out on the 17th of September, just for context. Now this came out a few days after CBAs also come out saying that you know prices will go up and I've made a video on this so you'll see a card pop up up in the top so you should just check that out. Westpac is the latest bank to upgrade its short-term home price targets citing record low interest rates, ongoing regulator support and a steady economy for its positive outlook. Okay, so record low interest rates, that's not gonna change for the next three to five years. I think it's gonna end up going lower. I do predict it'll go negative uh, in the coming months. And the ongoing support is really the, the bank, the RBA coming in and producing so much stimulus, uh, all of that money needs to find a home. The bank says residential property prices are now expected to experience a 5% correction through to late 2021 before a 15% price surge over the following two years. Okay, wow. Um, so these guys were also the same ones that came out probably a few months ago when COVID had started, saying that prices could potentially fall 10 to 15% this year alone. Now they're saying, we're just gonna experience five more percent till late 2021, and then we start the recovery. Westpac's economics team initially forecast an average 10% slide in property prices nationally through to June next year, when the first wave of Australia's coronavirus pandemic was at its peak in April. Westpac Chief Executive Peter King, who was appointed to the role permanently in April by Chairman John McLaren, said improved housing affordability and sustained fiscal support had also helped the bank shed its dour outlook and become more bullish. Of course, of course, please. <laughs> While the bank still believes national prices will continue to ease, its economists have substantially revised their outlook. So here's my thoughts on people that work at the bank. They're really smart people, and then there's really just pencil pushers. I feel like in this case, the pencil pushers were the first ones to get you know, these uh, negative headlines out because they were scared. They needed that support from the RBA. They needed support from the government. Now that they've received that support because you know they were allowed to defer, refer, uh, defer repayments, now they're coming out and going, hey, wait a second, I think actually property prices might go up. And the economists in the background are putting the numbers together and going, if we've got this much fiscal support, this much monetary support, how are prices gonna go down? And essentially now they've got uh, the forecasts coming out suggesting exactly that. So dwelling prices, actual forecast adjustment. Total forecast decline uh, is in the, I would say that's purple. Uh, since pre-COVID peak, it's red. So that's what they had predicted uh, and that's what the decline is looking like so far. Okay. Westpac Chief Economist Bill Evans and Senior Economist Matthew Hassan now forecast prices will fall 12% in Melbourne 5% in Sydney and 2% in Brisbane over that time. Something important to note here guys is that when we're looking at property prices and we look at mainstream media, when they talk about the Australian property market, we can clearly see just in this one line that there's markets within those markets. And when we get into like 5% in Sydney, not all of, five, all of Sydney is gonna grow up by 5% or go down by 5%. It really is focusing on specific subsets of those markets, and that's where research really comes into it. If you're simply looking at these media headlines and making your decisions, uh, it's a really unsophisticated way of investing. You really need to have the fundamentals in your strategy, your goals, and your mindset before you can actually go into looking for property. For the near term, our revised view, this means prices nationally are now expected to fall a further 2.3% out to June next year. 
wow, okay. So suddenly we've gone away from fiscal cliff in September and JobKeeper and JobSeeker, don't worry about it, we're gonna be fine next year. Of most importance is that we are much more optimistic about the pace of price appreciation over the following two years with a total expected increase of about 15%. Okay, nationally prices have already declined 2.7% since April. 2.7, <laughs> like on a $100,000 property, right? That's 2,700. So on a million dollar property, that's only $27,000. People are sitting there waiting, you might be one of them, where you're waiting for this cliff to happen, where you're waiting for prices to just crash so you can suddenly come and buy a property that's worth a million, buy it for $700,000 and you're cheering. Um, I've been saying this in all my videos, you should go back, check it out, I've done full analysis on this, right? I'm not just talking about media headlines and saying, oh, this is gonna happen or that's gonna happen. I've actually put proper numbers, proper economics applied to this and I'm showing you that you know, it's not what it seems. Property prices have dropped 4.6% in Melbourne since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and Sydney prices have dipped a more moderate 2.6%. Prices fell by 2.2% in Perth, 0.9% in Brisbane and 07 in Darwin and lifted by 0.3% in Adelaide, 1% in Hobart and 1.8% in ACT. There's a video guys I've got on this channel where I basically tell you the areas I'm looking at investing for myself and for my clients. You should definitely go check that out. Adelaide definitely featured on that one and so did regional centers that I target and I'm very vocal about. At present, CoreLogic indices show that six months after the March shock, house prices are gradually stabilizing or starting to slowly climb again in Sydney, Canberra, Adelaide, Brisbane and Perth. So basically, all capital cities is what they're suggesting. Economists said the correction would occur over four distinct stages, with the first, the initial impact on prices from the collapse in econ economic activity in the June quarter largely passed. Dwelling prices forecast for 2022 and 2023. Okay, so they're saying that over the next two years, this graph is suggesting that Sydney will grow at about 14%, Melbourne about 12%, Brisbane is expected 20% and then you've got 18 at Perth, you've got about 10 at Adelaide, which gives us an average of 15 for Australia overall. Again, I allude to the point I keep making. These are just very generic numbers. We need to deeper dive into these locations because you could buy a unit in an oversupply market in Sydney and you expect for the next two years it's gonna grow by 15%, you're gonna be wrong and you're gonna be in for a rude surprise. But at the same time, if you're able to get an asset in a good location with good infrastructure and good government spending, you might actually be able to get bigger numbers than what they're suggesting here. The second stage, which will cover December and March quarters, will be a period of relatively stable prices, possibly with some modest increases, although Melbourne will be at least one quarter behind the other states and will still be experiencing falls in prices in the December quarter. The third stage will some, see some limited re resumption of downward pressure on prices through 2021, as we see an increase in urgent or distressed sales relating to borrowers struggling or unable to resume mortgage repayments. This is very interesting. A lot of people have been talking about it on YouTube as well, distressed selling, people aren't gonna be able to make their mortgage repayments. If we just sit back and learn that over this year, they are willing, when I say they, the Australian government, the RBA and the rest of the world economies, they are willing to do whatever it takes to hold the economy up, to basically survive this period. We have done for the first time ever, lowest interest rates, we're almost at zero. We've also allowed for bank deferrals of repayments. That's never happened, okay? They did it for the initial six months to end in September, so in a few weeks. And then they came out and said, we're gonna extend that. Why did they extend it? They extended it because they know we are not where we are supposed to be. And we've already committed to the fact that we are open to deferring repayments. We're open to going back on our word. When we said negative interest rates, never gonna happen. Now it's a possibility. They will continue doing this until they have a solution. 
They have a bigger plan at this and you and I may be a bit less in tune with what's happening, but that's why you need to get educated. This is not simply someone reading an article and going, wow, okay, these are the things that are gonna happen. I'm gonna now suddenly act on this. There is so much behind this. I actually don't think distressed selling is gonna come into the market to the extent that it's being advertised. I think the banks will provide more support and I think saying that borrowers are struggling um, to resume repayments, unable to resume repayments, I don't think that's gonna happen. Nevertheless, there will be pockets of weakness associated with inner city high-rise apartments in Sydney, Melbourne, and those overstretched borrowers will be exposed by the failure of their underlying businesses. Okay, so during a time like a recession, the really bad operators of businesses and bad operators when it comes to property investing that didn't focus on you know, substantial data and research and also fundamentals in cash flow, they are gonna lose out. They are the ones that are gonna fall behind because if you've got a property that's you know, positive cash flow, if you lose your job, you don't need an income to actually keep that mortgage, to keep that asset. You have the rent coming in to pay for that. So that's where the difference is at the moment and I think a lot of people are getting exposed. The fourth phase will come once the selling pressure has worked through the system and prices lift again. Westpac economists said loan deferrals will still posed the greatest uncertainty to dwelling prices. The, the key question here is around the scale and intensity of selling pressure as continued financial distress leads some borrowers into urgent sale situations. Doubt that's going to happen. Nationally, there are about 410,000 properties sold each year, and if 10% of loans currently in deferral wind up on the market, that would see 60,000 urgent sales accounting for 15% of all turnover. Look, as much as I you know, feel for the people in this position, they've sort of put themselves in these positions. It doesn't matter if there's a recession tomorrow or if there's a COVID or uh, you know, a virus that gets introduced. You simply can't afford to stretch yourself too thin. And that's why when you're allowing yourself to get connected with someone with expertise and experience, we're able to help you really mitigate risk, right? Mitigation of risk is almost as important, if not more important than actually wealth creation. Because ultimately, if you are gonna find yourself in distress, you could end up losing all those gains over the years. So for us, it's not about just going, let's stretch every dollar and be you know, hand to mouth and stress out. I'm very much big about balance. I'm very much big about how everyone has a different level of mental health capacity, and that's what we need to address and be accommodating of. This would be enough to shift prices, particularly in areas where there are high concentrations of sales and demand is softer. The only part that I agree about this is that high rise units are going to suffer for the next few years. Um, despite the fact that there's a virus, you've also got an oversupply of units coming onto the market with an expectation that migration was going to be massive, which clearly we're not having because of the virus. Early this month, Commonwealth Bank dialed back its price fall prediction, anticipating a 6% fall over the next six months, lower than the 10% drop it forecast in April. That video I covered in a lot of detail in a previous video, so you should definitely check that out about what CBA was saying. That's the end of the article. I wanna know what your thoughts are. Are we actually gonna see a property price boom in these capital cities in the next two to three years? And if so, are you thinking it's in units, apartments, high-rise units, or do you think it's proper housing in good locations. I personally am still going very big on regional centers. I think the amount of news that is now coming out on regional properties and regional prices going up is massive. But what's underlying all of that growth is the fact that the government is pushing so much support, so much movement in terms of government spending in these areas, meaning that they also know there is a push for people to move from these capital cities that are high density to now the tree change, the coastal life change. And that's what people are gonna do as we ultimately get into more of a remote working space. They will realize they don't need to live in Sydney where house prices are ridiculously high or at an average of 800,000, 900,000. For that sort of price, you could be facing a really nice lake on like a six bedroom mansion. Uh, so it really does reduce the pressure. It almost puts you back into a society where you're allowed to have one person work, one person potentially taking care of kids, 
whether that's your, the female or the male of the family, it doesn't matter. Right now, we are in 2020 getting the benefits of what life looked like in 1995 when it comes to housing affordability in these markets. So it becomes a very attractive prospect for those guys. Tell me what your thoughts are in the comments down below. If you like this type of stuff, let me know. Thumbs up for the video. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe. I think about 70% of the people watching this channel haven't subscribed. So if you could, that would be amazing. I'll catch you guys all in the next video. Cheers.